The Unhoneymooners, Chapter 2 As soon as I'm out in the hallway, the noise, chaos, and fumes of the bridal suite seems to be vacuum sealed away. It is beautifully silent out here, it's so peaceful, in fact that I don't want to leave the moment to go find the door down the hall with the cute little groom caricature hanging above the peephole. The tranquil figurine hides what is no doubt a weed and beer fueled pre wedding razor happening inside. Even party loving Diego was willing to risk his hearing and respiratory health to hang with the bridal party instead. I give myself ten deep breaths to delay the inevitable. It's my twins with him, and I really am so happy for her I could burst, but it's still hard to view myself purely, especially in these solo, quiet moments. Chronic bad luck aside, the last two months have genuinely sucked. My roommates moved out, so I had to find a new, tiny apartment. Even then, I overextended that I thought I could afford on my own, and as my patented bad luck would have it, Galedo from the pharmaceutical company when, I, when I'd worked for six years. In the past few weeks, I've interviewed at no fewer than seven companies and haven't heard back from a single one of them. And now here I am, about to come face to face with my nemesis, Ethan Thomas, while wearing the shiny, flyed belt of Kermit the Frog. It's hard to believe there was a time when I couldn't wait to meet Ethan. Things between my sister and her boyfriend were starting to get serious, and Amy wanted to introduce me to Dane's family. In the parking lot at the Minnesota State Fairgrounds, Ethan climbed out of his car, with astonishingly long legs and eyes so blue I could see them from two car lengths away. Up close, he had more eyelash than any man has a right to. His blink was slow and cocky. He looked me squarely in the eye, shook my hand and then smiled a dangerous, uneven smile, suffice to say I felt anything but sisterly interest. But then apparently I made the cardinal sin of being a curvy girl, getting a basket of cheese curds. We had stopped just past the entrance to make a claim, to make a game plan for our day, and I slipped away to get a snack. There is nothing more glorious than the food at the Minnesota State Fair. I came back to find the group near the livestock display. Ethan looked at me, then down to my delicious basket of fried cheese curds frowned and immediately turned away, mumbling some excuse about needing to go find the home brew competition. I didn't think all that much of it at the time, but I didn't see him for the rest of the afternoon either. From that day on, he's been nothing but disdainful and prickly with me. What am I to think that he went from smile to disgust in ten minutes for some other reason? Obviously my opinion of Ethan Thomas is he combined me, with the exception of today, wholly because of this dress. I like my body. I'm never going to let someone make me feel bad about it or about cheese curds. Voices carry from the other side of the groom's suite. Some frothy cheer about man's suite or beer or opening a bag of Cheetos with the force of a head stare. Who knows? It's days wedding party we're talking about. I raise my face to knock and the door opens so immediately that I startle back, catching my heel on the hem of my dress and nearly falling. It's Ethan, of course it is. He reaches out, his hands easily catching me around the waist. As he steadies me, I feel my lip curl and watch the same mild revolution work its way through him as he pulls his hands away and tucks them into his pockets. I imagine he'll rip open a disinfectant wipe the moment he has the chance. The moment draws my attention to what he's wearing. A tuxedo, obviously, and how well it fits his long, wiry frame. His brown hair is neatly combed off his forehead. His eyelashes are as preposterously long as they always are. I tell myself that his thick, dark brows are obnoxious, overkill, Settle down, mother and matter, but they do look undeniably great on his face. 
I really don't like him. I've always known Ethan was handsome. I'm not blind, but seeing him dressed in black tie is a bit too much clarification for my liking. He gives me the same perusal he starts with my hair. Maybe he's judging me for wearing his clipped back so plainly. And then looks at my simple makeup. He probably dates makeup tutorial Instagram models. Profitably and methodically taking in my dress. I take a deep breath to resist crossing my arms over my midsection. He lifts his chin. That was free, I'm assuming. And I'm assuming driving my knee right into his crotch would feel fantastic. Beautiful color, don't you think? You look like a skull. Oh, Ethan, stop with the seduction. A tinny grin twitched the side of his mouth. So few people can pull off the color, Olivia. From his tone, I can tell I am not included in this few. It's Olive. It amuses my extended family to no end that my parents named me Olive, not the eternally more lyrical Olivia since I can remember. All my uncles on mom's side call me a Setuna just to wrinkle her. But I doubt Ethan knows that. He's just being a dick. He looks back on his heels. Right, right. I'm tired of the game. Okay, this is fun, but I need to see your speech. My toast? Are you correcting my wording? I have a hand for word. Let me see. He leans a casual shoulder against the door frame. No. This is really for your safety. Amy will murder you with her bare hands if you say something dickish. You know this. Ethan tilts his head, sizing me up. He's six foot four. And Amy and I are not. His point is made. Very clearly, with no words, I'd like to see her try. Dane appears over his shoulder, his face falling as soon as he sees me. Apparently, I'm not the bear winch they were both hoping for. Oh, he recovers quickly. Hey, Ollie, everything okay? I smile brightly. Fine, Ethan was just getting ready to show me his speech. His toast? Who knew this family was such a strickler for labels? Yeah. Dane notes to Ethan and motions back inside the room. It's your turn. He looks at me explaining. We're playing kings. My big brother is about to get owned. A drinking game before the wedding. I say and let out a little chuckle. Sounds like a prudent choice. Be there in a minute. Ethan smiles at his brother's retreating from before turning back to me. And we both dropped the grins, putting our game faces back on. Did you at least write something, I ask? You're not going to try to wing it, are you? That never goes well. No one is ever as funny of the cuff as they think they are, especially you. Especially me. Although Ethan is the portrait of charisma around nearly every other human, with me he's a robot. Right now his face is so controlled, so comfortably blank that I can tell whether I've genuinely offended him or he's baiting me into saying something worse. I'm not even sure if you could be funny. I falter, but we both know I'm committed to this horrific rape shot. On a cuff. A dark eyebrow twitches. He has successfully bited me. Okay, I growl. Just make sure your toast doesn't suck. I glance down the hall and then remember the other bit of business I had with him. And I assume you checked with the kitchen to make sure you don't have to eat the buffet for dinner. Otherwise I can do it when I'm down there. He drops the sarcastic grain and replaces with something resembling surprise. That's pretty considerate. No, I hadn't asked for an alternative. It was Amy's idea, not mine, I clarify. She is the one who cares about your aversion to sharing food. I don't have a problem sharing food, he explains. It's that buffets are literal cesspools of bacteria. I really hope you bring that level of poetry and insight to your speech. He steps back, reaching for the door. Tell Amy my toast is hilarious and not at all dickish. I want to say something sassy, but the only coherent thought that comes to my mind is how insulting it is that eyelashes like his were wasted on Satan's errand boy. So I just give a pretextory note and turn down the hall. 
It's all I can do not to adjust the skirt while I walk. I could be paranoid, but I think I felt his critical eyes on the tight sheen of my dress the entire way to the elevators. The hotel staff have really taken Amy's Christmas in January theme and run with it. Thankfully, instead of red velvet Santas and suffered reindeer, the center ice was lined with fake snow, even though it's easily 75 degrees in here. The reminder of the wet, slushy snow outside makes the entire room feel cold and drafty. The altar is decorated with white flowers and holy berries. Miniature pine wreaths are hung from the back of each chair, and tiny white lights swing from inside the branches. In truth, it's all very lovely, but even from the back where we've lined up, I can see the little placard attached to each chair encouraging guests to trust Finley Bridal for a special day. The wedding party is restless. Diego is speaking into the banquet hall and reporting back the location of hot male guests. Jules is violently trying to get the phone number of one of the groomsmen. Mom is busy telling Cami to tell Dad to make sure his zipper isn't down. We are all waiting for the coordinator to give the signal and send the flower girls down the aisle. My dress seems to be growing tighter with each passing second. Finally, Ethan takes his spot next to me, and when he holds a breath and then realizes it in a slow, controlled stream, it sounds like a resigned sigh. Without looking at me, he offers his arm. Although I'm tempted to pretend I don't, I don't notice, I take it, ignoring the sensation of his curved bicep passing under my hand, ignoring the way he flexes just a bit, gripping my arm to his side. Still setting drugs? I clenched my teeth. Ethan knows Damon well I worked for a pharmaceutical company. You know that's not what I do. He glances behind us and then turns back around, and I hear him take a breath to speak, but then he halted, wordless. It can't be about the size, volume, or general insanity of our family. They broke him in long ago, but I know something is bagging him. I glance up at him waiting. Whatever it is, just say it. I swear I'm not a violent woman, but at the sight of his wicked smile, aimed down at me, the urge to dig my pointy heel into the toe of his polished show is nearly irresistible. It's something about the line of skittled bridesmaid, isn't it? I ask. Even Ethan has to acknowledge that there are some pretty amazing bodies in the bridesmaid lineup, but still, none of us can really pull up spear mines green satin. Mind reading Olive Torres. My sarcastic smile matches his mock the moments people Ethan. Thomas remembered my name three years after we first met. He turns his face back to the front, smoothing his features. It's always hard to reconcile the restrained bite in Ethan I get with the shaman when I've watched him make his way through a room and even the wild one I've heard Amy complain about for years. Independent of how he seems determined to never remember a thing I tell him, like my job or my name. I hate knowing that Ethan is a terrible influence on Dane, pulling him away for, every, for everything from wild weekends in California to adrenaline-soaked adventures on the other side of the world. Of course, these trips conveniently con coincide with events deeply cherished by contest hunters such as my sister, his fiancé. Birthdays, anniversaries, Valentine's Day. Just last February, for example, when Ethan had whipped Dane off to Vegas for a guy's weekend. Amy ended up taking me to a romantic and free couple's dinner at the St. Paul Grill. I've always thought the basis for Ethan's coldness toward me were just that I'm curvy and physically repulsive and his bigoted, garbage human. But it occurs to me standing here, holding onto his bicep, but maybe that's why he's such an ass. Ethan resents that Amy has taken such a big part of his brother's life, but can't show that to her face without alienating Dane, so he takes it out on me instead. The epiphany washes cool clarity through me. She's really good for him, I say now, hearing the protective strength to my voice. I feel him turn to look down at me. What? Amy, I clarify. She's really good for Dane. I realize you find me completely off-putting, 
but whatever your problem is with her, just know that, okay, she's a good soul. Before Ethan can respond, the free wisdom carbonator finally steps forward, waves to the free magicians, and the ceremony begins. Everything I expected to happen, happens. Amy is gorgeous, Dane seems mostly sober and sincere, rings are exchanged, vows are spoken, and there is an uncomfortably wrenchy kiss at the end. That was definitely not church talk, even if this isn't a church. Mom cries, Dad pretends not to, and throughout the ceremony while I hold Amy's massive bouquet of free roses, Ethan's Ethan looms like a silent cardboard cut out of himself, moving only when he has to duck a hand into his coat pocket to produce the rings. He offers his arm to me again as we retreat down the aisle, and he's even stiffer this time, like I'm covered in slime and he's afraid it's going to rub off on his suit. So I make a point of leaning into him and then giving him a mantle bread flip when we're off the aisle allowed to break contact to this priest in different directions. We have 10 minutes until we need to meet for wedding party photos and I'm going to use that time to go remove wilted beetles from the dinner table flower arrangements. This kissel is going to cross some things off her list. Who cares what Ethan is going to do? Apparently, he's going to follow me. What was that all about, he says. I look over my shoulder. What was what about, I ask. He knows to are the wooden aisle, back there, just now. Ah, turn and I give him a comforting smile. I'm glad that we're not confused, you feel comfortable asking for help, so that was a wooden and important, if not required, ceremony in our culture. Your brother and my... Before the ceremony, his dark brows are pulled down low, hands shoved deep into his trouser pockets. When you say they find you off Putin, but I have a problem with Amy. I gape up at him. Seriously? He looks around as confused. Yeah, seriously. For a bit I'm speechless. The last thing I expected was for Ethan to need some sort of clarifying follow-up on our constant wave of snarky comments. You know, I wave a vague hand and his focus and away from the ceremony and the energy in the full room. I am suddenly less confident in my earlier theory. I think you resent Amy for taking Dan away from you, but you can't. Like, take it out on her without him getting upset, so a chronic dick to me. When he simply blacks at me, I bear alone. You've never liked me, and we both know it goes way past the cheese girls. I mean, you wouldn't even eat my oral compolo the 4th of July, which is fine, you lost, but just, to, but just so you know, She's great for him. I lean in, going for broke. Great. Ethan lets out a single incredulous laugh breath and then smothers it with his hand. It's just a theory I had. A theory. About why you clearly don't like me. His bro creases. Why I don't like you. Are you just going to repeat everything I say? I produce my list from where I drilled it into my small bouquet and shake it at him. Because if you're done, I have things to do. I get another few seconds of bewildered silence before he seems to surmise what I probably could have told him ages ago. Olive, you sound legitimately insane. Mom puts a flute of champagne in Amy's hand, and it appears to be on someone else's to-do list to keep it filled to the brim, because I see her drinking, but I never see it empty. It means that the reception goes from what was arguably a perfectly scheduled, slightly rigid affair to a true party. Noise levels go from polite to fast house. People swarm the seafood buffet like they've never seen solid food before. The dancing hasn't even started yet and Dane has already thrown his bow tie into a fountain and taken his shoes off. It's a testament to Amy's inner breaching that she doesn't even seem to care. By the time the toes roll around, Guessing even half of the room to quiet down seems like a monumental task. After gently tapping a fork against the glass a few times and accomplishing nothing by way of nose control, Ethan finally just launches into his toast, whether people are listening or not. I'm sure most of you will have to pee soon, he began speaking into a giant fuzzy microphone.
so I'll keep this short. Eventually the quote settles and he continues. I don't actually think Dane wants me to speak today, but considering I'm not only his older brother, but also his only friend, here we are. Choking myself, I lace a defeating crackle, Ethan poses and glances over at me, wearing a surprised smile. I'm Ethan. He continues and when he picks up a remote near his plate, a slight show of photos of Ethan and Dane as Kitz begins a slow scroll on the screen behind us. Best brother, best son, I am thrilled we can share this day with not only so many friends and family, but also with alcohol. Seriously, have you looked at that bar? Someone keep an eye on Amy's sister because too many glasses of champagne and there is no way that dress is staying on. He smirks at me. Remember the engagement party, Olivia? Well, if you don't, I do. Natalia grips my wrist before I can reach for a knife. Dane shouts out a drink, dude, and then laughs at, his, at this an obnoxious amount. Now I wish that the killing curse were a thing. I didn't actually take my dress off at the engagement party, by the way. I just used the hem to wipe my bra once or twice. It was not, not night, and tequila makes me sweaty. If you look at some of these family photos, Ethan says, gesturing behind him to where teenage Ethan and Dane are skiing, surfing, and generally looking like genetically gifted assholes. You'll see that I was the quintessential big brother. I went to camp first, drove first, lost my virginity first. Sorry, no photos of that. He winks charmingly at the crowd and a flutter of jiggles passes in a wave around the room. But Dane found love first. There's a roar of collective owls from the guests. I hope I'll be lucky enough to find someone half as spectacular as Amy someday. Don't let her go, Dane, because none of us has any idea what she's thinking. He reaches for his scotch and nearly 200 other arms join, his rising their glasses in a toast. Congrats, you two. Let's drink. He sits back down and glances at me. Was that sufficiently on the cuff for you? It was quasi charming. I glance over his shoulder. It still lights out, you inner trolls be sleeping. Come on, he says. You laughed. Surprising both of us. Well, it's your turn to show me up, he says, motioning that I should stand. I'm asking a lot, but try not to embarrass yourself. I reach for my phone where my speech is saved and try to hide the defensiveness in my voice when I say, Shut up, Ethan. Before, I, before standing. Good one, Olive. He laughs at his, as he leans in and to, to take a bite of his chicken. A smash rain of applause carry across the banquet hall as I stand and face the guests. Hello, everyone. I say in the entire room starts when the microphone squacks surely pulling the mech farther away from my mouth, and with a shocky smile I motion to my sister, a new brother-in-law. They did it! Everyone cheers as Dane and Amy come together for a sweet kiss. I watched them dance earlier to Amy's favorite song, Peter Satira's Glory of Love, and managed to endure the pressure of Diego's intense efforts to catch my eye and non-verbally commiserate about Amy's famously terrible taste in music. I was genuinely lost in the perfection of the scene before me. My twin is her beautiful wooden dress, her hair softened by the hours and movement, her sweet, happy smile. Tears break at my eyes as I type through to my notes app and open my speech. For those of you who don't know me, let me reassure you. No, you aren't that drunk yet. I am the bride's twin sister. My name is Olive. Not Olivia, I say, glancing pointedly down at Ethan. Favorite sibling, favorite in love, when Amy met Dane. I pause when a message from Natalia pops up on my screen, obscuring my speech. For your information, you boobs looks amazing out there. From the audience, she gives me a thumbs up and I swipe her message away. She spoke about him in a way I had never... What size bra are you wearing now? Also from Natalia. I dismiss it and quickly try to find my place again. Honestly, whose family texts them during speech they are obviously reading from a phone? My family, that's who. I clear my throat. 
I had never heard before. There was something in her voice. Do you know if Dane's cousin is single or could be? I gave Diego a warning look and aggressively swiped back to my screen. Something in her voice that told me she knew that I was different, that she felt different and I... Stop making that face, you look constipated. Constipated. My mother, of course. I swept it away and continued. Beside me, even smoothly, laces his hands together behind his head and I can feel his satisfied grin without even having to look at him. I push on, because I can't win this round, but I'm only two words deeper into my speech when I'm interrupted by the sound of a startled, pained groan. The attention of the entire room swings to where Dane is huddled over, clutching his stomach. Amy had just enough time to place a comforting hand on his shoulder and tur turn to him in concern before he claps a hand over his mouth and then proceeds to projectile vomit through his fingers, all over my sister in her beautiful free dress.